I always want to be a fisherman and uh, started when I was 16. To buy a weir license is very hard. There's only, there's only very few left and people that have them don't want to give them up. So it took me you know, quite a while to buy that. I got the weir license I think eight years ago and we put the weir in, we moved it from Walton to Bramber and uh, we set up in Bramber because it was closer to home, it was a better location um, for fish and science. And we've seen about 70 different species of the weir. We only harvest about seven species um, from uh, herring's our main species, flounder, gaspro, shed, um, scalpin, tomcod, and uh, squid would be our commercial species, mackerel as well, and then the rest of the species we see are non-commercial and we release them, we live, live release them. We have different ponds set up to hold things in so that we can release everything that we don't commercially use. My belief is that we're sustainable because they're non-efficient. We just take a little piece each tide, right? It's fine to have a, you know, an ocean full of fish, but I think people need to be able to fish them too. So Atlantic sturgeon are large anadromous fish. They're, they're kind of enigmatic. They're, um, you know, they're often uh, around the bottom and they're not encountered very much uh, by people. So we know a little bit about them in the river when they come in the river to spawn but their marine migration was pretty much just a big knowledge gap. You know, of course, this is Atlantic Canada, so I mean, a lot of the species that we work on, whether it's, uh, you know, alewives or it's sturgeon uh, or it's shad, um, a lot of species are commercial species that people gain their livelihoods from. Um, so it's really important that, uh, you know, that they're managed well. Uh, with OTM, one of the main focuses was looking at the movement and behavior in minus passage, uh, which is a place that's scheduled for turbine development. You know, people being concerned about uh, uh, about coastal development projects and things like that, and turbines, and will, will that affect minus space, and will it affect the bay, will it affect the ecosystem, uh, and that basically affects everybody. It affects people who have bed and breakfasts, and people who have inns, and people who have restaurants, and and tourism, and and everything, right? Scientists now we're getting into ecosystem-based management, which means basically we don't look at a, a species in isolation anymore, which is the way they used to be managed. Now we have to think about you know what they're eating, what's eating them, and all that kind of stuff in the system. And fishermen have always been uh, like that. If you ask Darren uh, when the Atlantic sturgeon are going to run up the river to spawn, he'll say around the first cut of hay. So you, you learn a lot from from fishermen. It's a unique collaboration between research scientists trained in the Western tradition, traditional knowledge scientists that are coming forward with a different approach, and we're both going out and doing something that none of us know what the answer is going to be. We are incorporating the First Nations perspectives, having them bring it to the table and help us design the experiments so that when we go out there and when we do this, everybody's pre-primed to pull in the results that we get and feed them back into their knowledge systems. Our role in the Bramber Weir revolves primarily around getting an infrastructure established that's going to let the people who are down there answer the questions that they have to answer. For community-led conservation to succeed, in my opinion, it starts with trust. All the people who are involved in this one have to believe in the motives and in believe in the information that the other groups are bringing to the table. If you have a disagreement, you discuss it, you talk it out, you build the trust from the discussions of this open and transparently, not from trying to steamroll over the top of that. Second thing that needs to be recognized is ideas, especially good ideas, originate from many different places. So historically, um, scientists, white coats, they must be right all the time. Well, it turns out that really good ideas are bubbling up, maybe from the kids in some of these local communities, and that it came from them sitting on the dock and watching and seeing something happen in the natural world that says, it's operating this way, and bang, you can take off with that. So we need to open those kinds of channels. As an independent fisherman, um, we're not working for somebody else, we work for ourselves. So the motivation is if we don't protect it, we don't have it, we don't have a living. The Stokesbury Lab started using my, um, my weir with their sturgeon study. I actually used to chase down Stokesbury's prof, which was Mike Dadswell, because I didn't, I didn't agree with their, their findings on sturgeon and their population estimates, and because uh, I knew where they were. And I said, you guys need to come up here and work with us, right? Because we got a lot of sturgeon up here and, and we got a venue that you can use. And uh, so they started sending their, their students up and they started tagging a lot of fish with us. And we started working together that way with Stokesbury. 
With OTN, was fascinated by the movements of the fish through uh, the acoustics because it's knowledge that I don't have. Living on the water, fishing as much as I have in as many ways as I have, I've learned a lot. Um, but you never learn it all, no matter who you are. The OTN stuff is cutting edge. My like, bottom line is I can't track a fish down in South Carolina. I can't track a fish in and out of the Minus Basin every day, the same fish. Everyone has their own strengths and then you can work off each other's strengths and then move forward with that. And I think that it's important for organizations to include everyone, whether it's First Nations, uh, local people, non-First Nations, but at least key people involved in decision making. So in that way, there is a voice from each direction. We collect data, uh, not only data from our knowledge holders, but da data, a uh, collection from academics, uh, local knowledge, local fisher people, because they all have different knowledges, they all have different strengths, so uh, working with those will help our research and our education grow. We're in charge of the seven generations ahead of us, so using that practice of Nadukalumk, taking only what we need today so we can save for the next seven generations because that's my responsibility. The Bramber Weir is such a small localized fishery and so opening up the Bramber Weir in a transparent manner then exposes that method of fishing uh, to a wide variety of people that may otherwise not really understand um, a very localized and uh, low impact type of gear. And so I think one of the biggest threats is actually not competing people at the table, it's no one at the table, right? It's no one showing up to a town hall when we ask questions about how do we want to use our marine space. Um, so I think it's really important to try to engage citizens and get people at the table to collaborate and to have conversations and try to create a cooperative solution that enables us to manage our ocean coasts and spaces in a way that meets with the vision of that community uh, and, and all ocean stakeholders across Canada. It's really hard to have a conversation about how to manage or govern a space if people don't have some kind of shared information. And you, you real almost couldn't find different scales of, of information and knowing um, than something like traditional knowledge that's passed through generations and something like telemetry technologies that are rapidly evolving day by day. The collaboration is, is absolutely the most important thing. We all, if we work in silos, we do not share information, we do not get anywhere, we never reach wisdom. We include always academic because that's the dominant language of science. And what I mean by that is the accepted one, we don't need to mess with that accepted language. We understand it, we respect it. I'm a local knowledge holder because I carve my living out of that area. So if you do science without that local knowledge holder, you're already behind. You're not taught to be a fisherman, nor are you going to school to be a fisherman. If you take a student or a scientist that's never been in that area and you put them out there, they're blind. That's the first step besides the traditional knowledge of that area and the species as well. Those two steps have to be put before an actual scientific activity. This is an evolution of, of uh, how science is done. It's starting. It's starting right here. The indigenous peoples and the local people, the reason there's conflict is we want to actually know what's really there. Like if we see that paper come out and there's only one eel in it, when we know there's thousands, we're going to argue that paper immediately. You need to be representative of what they see. We have to use the indigenous and we have to use the local knowledge first, then we write.